All right. Welcome back to another amazing episode of Open Relationships Transforming Together. I am your host, Andrea Miller, joined today by Brian Atkins and our sidekick, Joanna Schroeder, is out with sick kids today. So we are going to just really try to do well with oh, you, Joanna. We do have some of your questions and favorite things. Fear not. Um, we have an incredible guest teed up today, Dr. Alexandra Solomon. I'm just going to go in and, and give you the, the bio over here. She's awesome. Dr. Alexandra Solomon, PhD, is internationally recognized as one of the most trusted voices in relationships. Her framework of relational self-awareness has reached millions of people around the globe. A couples therapist, speaker, author, and professor, and so much more, Dr. Solomon is passionate about training, translating, excuse me, cutting edge research and clinical wisdom into people's relationships. She's on the faculty in the School of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern University, has a popular podcast called Reimagining Love, is the award-winning author of three books, uh, her new one, Everyday Love, Taking Sexy Back, and Loving Bravely. She has work everywhere from uh, The Today Show to Oprah. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you so much for being in Open Relationships. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, for having me. I'm happy to be here with you. Yeah, we have so much to cover. So I'm going to just get right into it. Um, I started reading your book. I love it. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, there's so much that is practical and, and funny. And I, I say this in the best way, um, obvious and radical, right? It's like, oh, we should all know this. But and yeah. we just need those reminders. So I appreciate all those reminders. What I was delighted to catch when I started reading it is this wonderful quote from Kristen Bell. Um, she says, Alexandra's work is mandatory for anyone who desires a roadmap to improve their relationships, in parentheses, especially with the person in the mirror. Her thoughtful teachings <laughs> make it easy to view the world with sincere humility, resulting in more confidence and peace within. And Kristen Bell, of course, is actress, producer, author, entrepreneur, and mental health advocate. So how wonderful have... Um, have you guys done, you know, have you partnered together or how um, how have you guys been working together? Well, that was, I mean, that was just such a, such a beautiful, um, you know, generous thing that she did to lend her, mm -hmm. you know, her little stamp of approval to, um, to my book. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she began following my Instagram feed um, a long time ago and she would share different posts that I had offered and so she I, I slid into her dms at one point and you know we've had oh little, amazing yeah back and forth with each other and um and then when the time came you know i, I made the big ask and she said yes and it was such a wonderful you know just a lo lovely experience to share with her and have you uh, had the chance to get to know dax at all i have not i have oh, not okay. but that's on, we, one we of, love, that's we on love my list it. of yeah, yeah, Yay. absolutely. He's yeah, wonderful. We, we love Dak Shepard and his show, um, Armchair Expert, and of course are a mm -hmm. big fan of of Kristen's. And what I, I mean, what I love is just what a cool couple they are. So successful and yet so down to earth and how they keep it real is so refreshing. I mean it gives mm -hmm. I feel like it, it gives permission to those of us who maybe aren't as uh well known or maybe aren't quite as successful. Uh, to also keep it real. It's, you know, I think I've been doing this work for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. And I, I think <laughs> we're we're living and loving in a really exciting time when there is far mm -hmm. less shame and stigma around our struggles, our struggles as individuals, our struggles as partners, our struggles as parents. So I think there's a kind of liberation and freedom in, you know, in all of us saying, we don't have this figured out and that's okay. And we can offer resources to each other and, you know, sort of be alongside each other on the journey. And that's, that's essential. I couldn't agree more. That is, in fact, the whole point of the show. We here in Open mm. Relationships, I, we call it transforming together because what we've realized, and I, I personally have realized in my own life, that when I am willing to be humble and, and keep it real, especially with myself, that that's where the magic lies okay. and and mm -hmm. it takes it i mean i'll say it, i'll say it in my own you know praise it takes a lot of courage to do that right i mean nobody wants to say they're wrong 
But what I have found in my own life is when I'm willing to say, oh man, I, my ego took over there or I was wrong. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It just, it feels like such an opportunity to go, whoops, let me make that heartfelt apology. Let me keep it real with myself. Let me be honest and humble. And, mm-hmm. and it's just cool when, when you see other, uh, especially famous, super successful people that are living that, right? It's easy yeah. to say it. It's yeah. a whole other thing to live it. You know, I had a, an experience recently with um, with my young adult son uh, who was away mm-hmm. at college. And I had this memory that was old. I mean, it's probably from, I don't know, five or six years ago of a moment that, mm-hmm. you know, that I would wake up in the morning and <laughs> spy myself a little angsty about whatever mm-hmm. elements of my life. Mm-hmm. And this would be a memory that I would flash on um, on a not so infrequent basis. And so I just said to him, hey, are you are you open to kind of like rewind the tape and revisit something that happened between you and I a while ago that I don't like how I handled it? And it kind of it's sticking oh. in my craw. And um, mm-hmm. and he didn't you know, I shared the memory. I mean, I know exactly where we were in the house. I know exactly what he said and what I said. And he didn't remember the memory per se. But when I reminded him of what happened, he said, I'm really glad you're apologizing for that because that wasn't. That wasn't right. That isn't how you should have handled that moment. Oh my and, gosh! You know, it's it didn't matter what, whether he remembered it or didn't remember it because I remembered it. And so I, anyways, my point being that ideally, our you know, this is the whole point of relational self awareness. The the heart of my work is that we catch ourselves mm-hmm. and we're willing to ask for a redo. We're willing to repair, you know, in a tighter time frame. But the point is, something can be six years old and still, you know, can be worth. Um, revisiting in the name of transformation, in the name of growth, in the name of, you know, and now that memory sits differently inside of me. Oh my God. Hallelujah. And amen, sister, because that is it. <laughs> like, in fact, I was going to ask you a question along those lines later. Maybe you have another story or two to share because when I think about that kind of courage, that is how you set yourself free. It's how I set myself free. Mm. Why is it? Because you've been doing this for so long. Why is it so hard for people? I mean, I think I have some answers, but I want to ask you because you, you know, you've you've worked with thousands of people. It's that, and that's what I mean by obvious. It's so obvious what we need to do, and yet the vast majority of us don't do it because it's so freaking scary. Why is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that I think there can be. I mean, I think in this example, probably one of the constraints or one of the things that was getting in my way is that we as, I think for all of us as parents, you know, it, it can be difficult to kind of hold on to that idea of I'm an authority figure in my home and I screw up and make mistakes. So I think that can be sort of a growing edge around the parent-child relationship. Like we can be sort of afraid of losing authority by making apology when- right. The exact opposite is, in fact, true. Is our willingness to make apology is what helps our kids really be able to kind of trust our guidance and our wisdom. You totally. know, totally. Um, and I think in our intimate partnerships, I think there can be, um, you know, one of the constraints can be just shame that if I, if I ask you to look with me at a behavior that I don't like, I can be afraid that um, that you're going to see that that rather than saying. I can see what you mean. I didn't like how you handled it either. And I love you very much. I think the fear mm-hmm. is that a partner might say, I can see what you mean. You are bad, wrong, less than, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a, a way that we are afraid of, um, you know, of, of rejection by our partner or that then this apology is going to mean that the sum total of our relationship challenges sit at my feet. Amen. And all I can say is it it is it is logical in some ways and yet so deeply irrational, right? Because yeah. what we yeah. all crave is to be seen. And yet that <laughs> is all it is simultaneously terrifying. And so yeah. I've really thought about it in my own life how much a prisoner I have been. And you're right, when it comes to shame and the embarrassment and when you say, hey, I'm I'm willing to keep it real and make the apology and say I was wrong. And you I, I feel like the 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 fear, what are the, what is it? Um 
false expectations appearing real, right? The uh, acronym for fear <laughs> that we we really do ourselves such a huge disservice by not being more truthful. I mean, and and often it starts with ourselves. I had an experience right. recently where I had a big breakthrough the next day when um, I'll I'll keep it brief, but I was chatting about somebody that I was close to with somebody else I was close to, and and she was pushing back. On, on me a little bit. And I, I was a little entrenched in my point of view. And I woke up the next day and I thought, you know, she's right. And I'm wrong. And I, mm. I, I need to own that. And I like to think of it, honestly, <laughs> tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong, Alexandra, especially when it's big, it can be like an emotional orgasm. Do you agree? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really, oh. I mean, it's like, oh, we don't want to, right? We, yeah. it's like, want to stay in control and what is an orgasm i mean yes we know yeah. physically well we hope we all know um uh-huh. how good it feels and 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 what it implies and metaphorically and everything else but i was thinking about that um in this context and in the context of how often we hold back emotionally and especially in our relationships because it is it is so much e- you know easier in air quotes because I actually don't think it's easier. It feels yeah. so much safer to keep ourselves protected. But then mm-hmm. we have an invisible wall that is preventing us from having real intimacy. Right? I mean, yeah. it's a big yeah. fucking conundrum that we put ourselves into. For sure. And Andrew, I think that you're I think you're pointing to something really important that you know when you were asking before, like what keeps us from letting our guard down. I think what you just pointed mm-hmm. to in the example with your friend is another like actual very real constraint is that so often in the moment we really cannot see our part we really can't like that is part of the nature of being you know emotionally dysregulated or triggered Mm -hmm. or activated like that very state of feeling upset in a moment it feels like our perspective is the perspective it feels like our perspective Mm -hmm. is capital t truth and, and, yeah. and we get trenched, we, we get in our own way, right? I'm sure the moment with my son that I was describing before, the reason I said what I said is that I believe my perspective to be the only perspective, right? And with your friend, when you're like sort of pushing back against your friend's perspective, you were pushing back because in that moment, it wasn't like in that moment, I imagine there wasn't a conscious battle going on inside of you. In that In that moment, all you could see and feel and be in touch with was, was, your resistance and it wasn't until you stepped away and let the conversation mm-hmm. settle that you were like oh wait a minute maybe my friend was holding up a mirror and there's some me part of it to look at it's why a lot of my training i talk about the golden equation of love my stuff mm-hmm. plus your stuff equals our stuff and that is true 100 percent of the time there's always some blend of my stuff plus your stuff equals our stuff. There's always a dance, a choreography, a pattern, a cycle. But sometimes we really, it it is really actually hard in a moment because we are so hurt, because we are so activated by a, a, a wound from the past that we actually cannot see the way that we are playing into the difficulty and the frustration of this let, moment. Let me ask you right there, because I could feel it. If I'm being honest with myself at that moment, I definitely could feel it. And I'm just wondering if I'm thinking back to the the many times when um, when there was a hurt and heartache and whether it was with my husband or somebody else, our bodies are, are beautiful in providing signals to us that maybe our brains aren't quite ready to admit or process do you feel like is there something is there something a, a message or a lesson that we can share with folks just to say hey if you're feeling that discomfort in your body um it, that that there's a that tension is telling you something it's not just saying mm. that other person is so wrong just to right <laughs> i don't know i mean there's because there's a part of me that says there is a such a propensity to blame and make it all about them and i know uh-huh. for myself if I'm being honest, and my goal, my job here is to be honest, it's like I I know when um my body tells me when I'm in the wrong, right? Because if if I'm not in the wrong a little bit, then wouldn't I be, uh, I don't know, a little more physiologically calm? And I guess if somebody's right. shouting at you that maybe you're still feeling 
triggered, but it just it does feel like there's this over propensity in our society to blame the other person. And it just feels like that is creating a very, very toxic um, Uh relational um, experience in our society. Yeah, what what you're inviting your listeners to play with is is to get a little bit suspicious or curious yeah. about what's happening in their bodies. To notice that that stir, whatever it's like, whether it's heat in your chest or a flush in your cheeks or a quickening of your heart, yeah. that that that's not just righteous indignation. You know, Mm -hmm. that is that is an invitation to slow down and to kind of keep yourself in the equation and to wonder what's going on inside of me and to be a little more. So it it sounds like what you have learned is to be a little bit suspicious about yourself, you know, that your that your body's your your body's reaction is more than just like this isn't right. It's more than righteous indignation. It's like, oh, okay, I'm being pointed towards something that maybe I'm resisting looking at the resisting is the best word you said you used that word before and absolutely um i I, uh, just came from a gathering of some friends and family recently and there's just there's just a lot of hurt and heartache and i'm listening to to the individuals and there is so much um um resistance there and on the one hand and I, I realize I feel like I'm talking kind of generically, but I'll, I'll, I'm thinking about you one have to, yeah, uh, yeah. person, yeah, a kind of person in particular uh-huh. who just feels so hurt um, uh-huh. by the way um, her her mother-in-law is treating her. And she's just so resigned into uh-huh. um, like, I can't I can't do anymore. And this person is wrong. And uh-huh. they're just and and I love this. I mean, I, I love them both. And it just when I think of that resistance that um, that feels to be there, I, I'd wonder what what do you? I mean, because you're the expert, you've um, helped so many people. What do you advise when you see? Because it is so common. It's the it's the very common people are just. It's like you could be talking about the exact same situation if you ask yes. the first person, they'll tell you something it's red and then you ask the other person and they say it's blue it's like they've watched a totally different movie Mm -hmm. it feels so common and it feels so much about these people are just they are so convinced that the other person is charitably you know if you will clueless or contemptuously um (laughs) um you know beyond ignorant right and Mm-hmm. and maybe mm-hmm. even villainous. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering, yeah, right. what do you do? I mean, how do you get folks to go, wait, the, like you have to put them, I mean, I, like Kristen Bell says, you put the mirror up to yourself because it feels yeah. like that is where the, I mean, that's where the orgasm is, right? <laughs> it's like, oh my right. God, I can, I, right. this is this is the yeah. opportunity I can, I can only give myself. I mean, now I'm getting my yeah. metaphor very carried away. <laughs> but what do you, what do you say to people? And, and is this, it feels so, common in in my own life from mistakes that I've made to people that I'm close to that I've observed is that one of the biggest things that you see in the work you do with relationships that there's yes, just 100%. this huge disconnect yeah. okay yeah 100 percent. what's you know, the answer the, <laughs> yeah I know well let's I want to make sure I want to make sure we don't get mired into this example about a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law but I will tell you that the reason right. that in-law dynamics can get going with mm-hmm. as much heat and fire as they do is because where does a daughter-in-law turn to talk about her frustration with her mother-in-law? She turns to her spouse. And her spouse yeah. is then the fulcrum of the most intense triangle of their entire lives, where on the one hand, they have their wife, and on the other hand, they have their mother. And so then just the mere existence of that triangle ends up creating polarization because any moment when the partner tries to translate their mother to their wife, Uh the Uh wife is going to dig in more and say, no, but you don't get it. No, but you don't get it. No, but you don't get it. The the healing comes from these two sitting down together, basically daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, and like basically taking turns being customer service windows for each other. Uh Right? Like, Uh and really it is. And I would, and I would, if I was facilitating this healing process, like Uh I would have, you know, a, a thing like, 
almost like a talking stick, you know, where it's really clear. Okay, right now we're talking about daughter-in-law's hurt. And, mm-hmm. and my job is to help mother-in-law bear witness to all the hurt of daughter-in-law. Okay, process, process, process. But what process. if, she, okay, what if now, the mother-in-law... Re- okay, okay, sorry. I'll let you go. Well, <laughs> and then, right, and then it'll be, mother, you know, be, it'll be mother-in-law, right? But it all, I mean, this is, why, mm-hmm. this is why couples therapy is powerful. This is why family therapy is powerful because it's very, very hard. You know, both, both daughter-in-law and mother-in-law need to be held in that space because the pain is mm-hmm. real, because it is very hard to be understanding when you feel misunderstood. So really that's the power of bringing in a therapist is a therapist, you know, relationship therapist, couple and family therapists are literally trained. I've done it for 20 years. I've been training, you know, people to do systemic work. We are, we are trained to think systemically, to put everything in that systemic framework of why, you know, in what way is the mother-in-law triggering the daughter-in-law? In what way is the daughter-in-law triggering the mother-in-law? But you oftentimes need to have an out, a third person who's not the spouse slash kid, you know, in the okay, triangle. Okay, well, let me ask you there, though. If, if there's no chance for the, I mean, no, let's say there's just no chance for there to be a therapist. What advice uh-huh. do you have for the daughter-in-law? Um, I've, I, I'll, I'll say this. I, it can either be status quo, which is painful. It can be um, go no contact. And I'm going to come back to right. you with this because this feels like an increasingly big trend. Yeah. Or it feels like there is some kind of freaking jujitsu that she can bring potentially that she can at least try to bring that can open things up. And you said it beautifully. It's hard to be understanding when we need to be understood. But is that where we start? Yeah, it's the only place to start, right? She cannot. I mean, she she could give us a 32 slide PowerPoint of how her mother in law should change. <laughs> you know, yep. she could. Yeah, she could give it to us alphabetically. She could and give I it agree with most of those things. Yeah, sure, mm-hmm. sure. And that is not where her power lies. Her power lies in her w- within her own perspective and her, as you're saying, jujitsu. The place I'd want her to start is what happens with mothers in law or parents in law in general is we we bring our unfinished maternal wound to our mother-in-law. There are lots of ways when we enter a mother-in-law relationship, it's like, can you please be the mama I didn't have? So that's Mm. where I would start is with whatever grief there is that this this new potential mama figure could not heal whatever she brought in. So that's one, that's one, that's one hypothesis. And listen, there may be a a number of ways that this mother, that the mother-in-law also needs to be looking at her control issues and what it's like to watch this child that she raised transition their locus of loyalty from mama to wife. You know, mm-hmm. there is a grief in becoming a mother-in-law. There's a letting go in becoming a mother-in-law. There's a mm-hmm. surrender in becoming a mother-in-law. So that's all real. Well, if, and, yeah. and I agree. And I, when I, you know, I'm looking at this more from my friend's perspective, right? Because I'm not in touch with the mother-in-law, right? And so when I, mm-hmm. as, and I try to be the kind of friend that, and <laughs> I can be overbearing. Let's face it; all my friends are nodding, like "oh, just a little," um, <laughs> because it's back to the we all have way more power than we realize. And so, uh, when I see these people that I love hurting and suffering, and again, it's the whole freaking point of the show. And I'm saying, because I can't not say it out loud because I'm hyper. Oh my gosh, you have more power than you realize, and. And I'm I'm urging this this person that I love to meet, you know, essentially is to meet the mother-in-law where she is, right? Now, I can't talk to the mother-in-law. That, that's not that's a relationship right. that I have. That's right. Right? So then it's back to the jujitsu of saying, okay, I so, and I, I mean, this is what I've done with my husband. And I had a, ma- <laughs> I was going to say, I had a major, oh, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, whoa, like, let, Andrea, rein yourself in today, would you? <laughs> no, but I had this major aha because I made the mistake for so long of so desperately wanting to be understood. That was so mm-hmm. important to me. I was so, and I'm a, I always say I'm a type AAA Aries. So uh, as a ram, what is one of our characteristics? We are stubborn, right? And it has served yeah. me so well, except for not in my marriage and not in certain other relationships that have been hard. My big aha recently was, oh my gosh, Andrea, you are so... Um, you are so fixated on being understood and let's face it, being 
more than a little self-righteous. If you can just mm -hmm. have the trust in yourself, and my husband's name is Sanjay, and in Sanjay to put that down for a few minutes, then maybe a breakthrough can happen. And a huge breakthrough just happened. And so when I think this, of this idea that we all have more power than we realize to show up a little bit differently, it just feels like they're, they're, and there's room for magic. And yet they're, to me, and I, it's not just this one friend who's dealing with the mother-in-law, I feel like I hear the but, 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 uh, one of my other friends yeah. is having that with her daughter. And it's like, there's so yeah. like, it's like everybody, not everybody, almost everybody just seems really resistant to this idea mm -hmm. that maybe, maybe they can show up differently. Yep. I have this, I have this, um, I had the same best friend for 40 years and, um, I have a particularly fraught relationship with my, um, I will just, I'll say an elder. I have a particular particularly okay. fraught relationship with one of the elders in my family. And sure, years ago, I was complaining, you wouldn't believe what they said and you wouldn't believe what they did. And my best friend, God love her, was like, then, why? Why would you expect anything different, right? It's like mm, this person is my aunt best friend. taught us years ago. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. you know, when people show you who they are, believe them, right? This elder in my family has shown me who they are. Crystal clear, mm. you know? I imagine for your friend, this mother-in-law has shown her who she is. And so mm -hmm. we get we get caught arguing. I have a beautiful quote I love from uh, Byron Katie, one of my favorite spiritual oh, teachers. Oh, I love Byron and Katie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She says, when I argue with reality, I lose, but only 100% <laughs> of the time. You know? Totally. So it's like, your friend is 100%. arguing with reality. She is, she is mm -hmm. stuck in this story of how it should and right and wrong yeah. and good and bad and nobody could and eight out of 10 therapists agree and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And mm -hmm. she's grinding herself down to a nub, you know, with mm -hmm. this difficult, with, with this, um, with these shoulds. And what you're saying is she's losing sight of her power and her power. There's so much power in refusing to take the bait. There's so much power in mm -hmm. letting go of the wish that somebody else could be different. You know, a lot of, as you're saying, magic opens up when we show mm. up, when we show up with somebody, because it's, you know, hopefully she won't go no contact with her mother-in-law unless it's absolutely toxic mm -hmm. abuse. Da, da, da. But if she could show up and just know what she's going to get, then she creates a possibility for delight or surprise or acceptance or grace. And I would bet that there are ways that the daughter-in-law's resistance to the mother-in-law fuels the mother-in-law's awful behavior. Totally. So the power in your friend's hands is to drop the the wish for the mother-in-law to be any other way. And then, okay, so if you've dropped that, now what's open up to you? Totally. I mean, that is it. You drop that, you drop that wish. You drop the should. I love Byron Katie as well. And it feels like that you just said it, but I'm just saying it again, like that's where the magic happens. That's where like I feel like when you can let go of that resistance and and the mother in law, she to be fair, she's not awful, but it really it just it feels like it is a disconnect in expectations. And mm -hmm. and there's a lot of suffering as a result of it. Well, let me ask you this. Um estrangement, it feels like it's becoming increasingly common. There's a no contact trend burgeoning on yeah. TikTok, but it's not just on TikTok. It is in real people's lives. I can't tell you the number of people that I've heard who have said, we are no contact. We are no contact. Yeah. And it feels like, it, it just, it feels like a major, um, just a major problem because I I don't think anybody can go no contact and be sincerely forgiving and peaceful. So now you've gone yeah. no contact and you feel righteous and you say that person's an asshole and they're terrible but but you're still you're still suffering yourself aren't you and can you yeah. just talk about how much are, are you seeing this in your practice and what do you advise people yeah i um there's research to suggest that almost 30 percent of us are estranged from a, a significant member of our what? family that's a, a very high number mm -hmm. holy mm -hmm. smokes yep. That's even and you higher. Know, I would the, have placed it a little bit lower than that. So that's an insane number. Yeah, it's very high. The most likely, the, the most common scenario, uh, the relationship at most risk of a, estrangement is um, 
relationship with uh, father post-divorce. Um, dads post-divorce are particularly at risk sure. of being um, estranged from their adult kids, and that can happen around a remarriage very often. Um, but it can be, right, it can be, you know, just about anybody. And I think there's, and again, you know, in some ways it is a side effect. I, I talk about this as a transition we've made from role-based relationships to soul-based relationships. Um, you know, a couple of generations ago, all relationships, um, marriages, parent-child relationships were heavily role-bound. They were really heavily dictated by expectation and loyalty and duty. And, you know, as the mother, I do X, Y, Z. As the child, you do A, B, C. As the husband, you do X, Y, Z. As the wife, you know, and I'm using husband and wife intentionally because traditionally, right, heterosexual marriage was the only model of relationship, of intimate relationship. Okay. And so we are now kind of emerging into a context where family systems are much less hierarchical and much more democratic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And where people are looking very powerfully at intergenerational transmission of trauma and patterns. Um, and the and the challenge comes from the bottom of the tree up the tree. It is much more likely that an yeah. adult kid is cutting off a parent than a parent cutting off a kid. It does happen mm -hmm. that way, but it mm -hmm. is far less mm -hmm. common than up the tree. And so sure. up the tree mm -hmm. is like, listen... I don't play by the rules you play by or you're toxic or you're, you know, you haven't had enough therapy or, you know, um, and certainly there are situations, of course, where things are, where people are abusive, where mm -hmm. trauma has been denied, where addiction mm -hmm. and betrayal and deceit are rampant. And really, there does become a choice for some people where it is either I save myself, you know, if I have to save myself, I, the only way I can save myself is by stepping away. That is true. Right. But I think there's a lot of gray cases where where when we step into our own power, we don't know anything that feels like an accommodation feels like an abandonment. Mm -hmm. Right. Like now I know this about myself. I know what I need in my relationships. And therefore, if my dad can't see me the way I need to be seen, I can't tolerate it. So I think that is that is where we kind of have gone um, a little bit. Astray. Totally. Well, and I've heard that a lot. Um that even that phrasing, which if I, when I'm trying not to overstep my bounds and give unsolicited advice, haha. Uh -huh. So I'll hear somebody say exactly that, dad or mom or you know whomever. I need you, and I just want to say, whoa, 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 with the I need you, <laughs> right? Nope. I mean, it's like, right. yeah, I want to say a big, yeah, you don't need. First of all, you don't need them to do anything, right? And that's a little Byron Katie, right? Like. Forget mm -hmm. that. And instead, I just when I think about the language of being able to say, and and it and it's a huge to me, it's like a huge paradigm shift. And it's I I, you know, when I get from that, like I need you, you know, dad, Sanjay, kid, mm -hmm. you know, you name it, to back in my body and back in my wisdom. <laughs> and it's like, oh, um, it, you know, I I would love to tell you this thing. It's really hard for me. Right. Yes. I mean, it's just like it just That's even right. like when I think of those words, I feel it in my body. And I Me just too. it. I wonder um, how many people when you, you know, in your practice and even in, you know, in broadly in your life, just like me, it's like you're connected to a lot of people. Do you just feel like there are are folks that are doing themselves such a disservice by being so insistent that they need that thing? They can't get that thing. Right. And they go no contact at their own expense. Do you do you see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like it feels <laughs> like when we cut somebody off, I get the extremes. There there are extremes, but it feels like the extreme is the extreme and it's small. Versus mm -hmm. like it can't thirty percent can't can't be in that extreme situation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 When we you know, it doesn't matter if we are it doesn't matter if we're 25 or 55. When we are with our own parents, for example, that is a, it can be a regressive experience, right? Like the little young part of us, the eight-year-old comes with us every time we visit our parents or sit with our, you know, elders, like those young parts of us come along. And so that's where the I need comes from, right? Because it, it has the intensity of a of a child's longing and it feels like if you can't see me in this way you know 
things are quite dire. And so I think it's, it, it speaks to how important it is for us, you know, as an adult, as an empowered adult, I can tend to my younger self. I can, mm-hmm. I can provide, right? I can provide what my younger self needed and didn't get. And I can feel sad mm-hmm. that I didn't get that, that my family wasn't able to provide that. But I can provide it now and I can cultivate an intimate partnership where we can provide that to each other. Or we can witness that to each other. We can validate that to each other. And Mm -hmm. then when I go to be with my elders, there's less need there. There can still be sadness, but then Mm -hmm. there's less intensity around having to prove something. I don't need my parent to prove that to me because I've proved it to myself. My partner Mm -hmm. is able to validate it for me. And, um, and then I can, and then I open myself up to just accept what is right to take the parts of the relationship with my parent, for example, that are available. I can sort of meet my parent on my parents' terms and have that not be an abandonment. That's not me abandoning myself because I've already validated. I validated to my little girl part that we can't get what we need here, but guess what? We don't need to. We don't need to go to mom for that. That's not because we are providing that to ourselves. We can go to mom and we can be gentle with her. We can be gracious with her. We don't have to also stay forever, right? So there are ways that... Mm -hmm. Sometimes that urge to cut off is actually, you know what? I can be fully present on a three-day visit. So I'm not, I'm going to come for three days and be fully present. I'm not going to come for a week and become irritated. (laughs) And, you know, so I think Mm -hmm. some of it is like, it's kind of playing with that jujitsu around what is the best way? What are the conditions that help me show up Mm open-heartedly versus like with an X to grind where I want to, you know, prove something about what I didn't get when I was little. Alexandra, do you have any other stories that come to mind? You were so amazing in sharing the story about your son and how you made that repair and asked for a redo. And I love his response, like, yeah, good, you know, and how nice, (laughs) right, for him to not say, oh, it's okay. I just love it. Like, I love that guy now. I don't even know him, right, where he's like, well, it's a good thing you did. And and like you said, Mm -hmm. you gave yourself and your son this beautiful gift and in part, I'm just wondering if you have any other stories that you'd feel comfortable with that come to mind, because so often I feel like it's sharing these stories that, pe- you know, people will, you know, take a story away. And I, so I'm just curious. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if there is something you're like, oh, you know what? There was this thing and I was really, you know, I felt like I was wrong or whatever. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know that I'll be able to think of one on the spot, but it was making me think, I mean, I think that's maybe the way we circle back to that is it's a model, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, you know, I'm in midlife and my son is, um, is 21. But I think that when our, I think it's the message really is, I think, I think if parents want to avoid estrangement, I think that parents of adults and young adults really need to be willing to to when when a kid because it's gone the other way too right i've had um both of my kids have come to me and said hey i want to talk through something or i want to talk about you know this yeah, yeah. my son over winter break my son's like can we just do a little bit of like reviewing childhood traumas and i was like you know oh god was like or you got oh. real well nervous you're like hang on let me get a tequila <laughs> yeah right that's right a mama needs to yeah but, you know, like yeah. my willingness to to regulate myself, I mean, clearly this was a child who grew Related. up in a house with a, a therapist, you know, but he was like, yep, I have, there's been some things on my mind. I think that's part of emerging adulthood is like emerging mm. adulthood is you're looking back, you're looking at your early years, you're figuring out who you want to be going forward. There's a lot of like kind of reckoning. And so mm-hmm. I think it is really a call to action for parents yeah. of young adult kids or adult kids to be like in that moment when your kid's like, hey, can we talk about something? To feel mm-hmm. the weight of your defensiveness, put your hand yeah. on your heart, take some deep breaths and know that mm-hmm. you have so you have so much power. The playing field with our own kids. You know, my son is yeah. three inches taller than me and outweighs me by about a hundred pounds. But uh-huh. I have so much power in his eyes, right? Sure. The power yeah. of my ability to validate him, validate his experience and not become defensive not- is immense. So I think there really is, this, I think what we can do, what we can take away from those estrangement statistics is say mm-hmm. there's a massive call to action for all of us who are nurturing the next generation to be willing to hear the feedback. 
you know, and to be willing to say that makes sense. Yeah. I love that so much. And in part, I, I know that there is, I mean, I think again, in my fairly broad uh, circle of friends, families, et cetera, that that is so painful. And what would you say, I feel like you're just saying proactively or almost like re um, in response to if a teen or an adult child comes to you as a parent says, hey, I'd like to talk about this thing. Would you recommend if if a child hasn't done that to say, you know what, I just I want to feel this out a little bit um, where they can they can almost like preempt something from going mm. wrong because they're willing to have that conversation and willing to be vulnerable to say, hey, I love you, you know, whatever. I love you a lot. I I tried to be perfect. I know I wasn't. This is, if there's anything you want to say to me, I'm going to be as brave as I can be because I'm looking around and I'm seeing some um, some pretty bad stuff. I don't want that to happen to us. Would you recommend that? A oh, parent I love saying that? Or, I love uh, it. I love it. I love right. it. I love it. Yes, absolutely. I think it's so. Yeah. It's just, and I think it, I can just see, I can see a parent and a, you know, young adult kid on a walk together doing that. You know, sometimes these conversations are easier to have when our bodies are in motion. We're sort of like side yes, by side. I love it. Yeah, looking but, out do together at something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's, because I think it can, it can be really hard. And the, and the parent, as you're saying, you know, the mm -hmm. parent is saying to their kid, I want to be brave. And so the parent is then, the parent is has already done some of their own reckoning of saying, listen, there was as much, my desire to have been perfect was A, misguided from the beginning because kids don't need perfect parents. They need good enough parents and they need, you know, parents who can be relational. And B, um, I didn't, I don't, I don't have to be perfect because I can, like, this is, I'm, I'm opening the floor for a redo. So even if there was something missed in this moment, right here, right now, I'm making a new memory. I'm making a new connection you know it's such, totally. a, it's such a responsible way it's such, it's like it's never over i think we often think like our kids are baked at age 18 no you could have a conversation with your 30 year old kid and you could make a new layer you can create a new layer of that relationship i yeah i'm loving this i'm sitting here there i've got like my um rolodex uh like rolling through my head going oh i would love to ask this person i would love like like it makes oh. me excited to even think, you know, besides our kids. And I've had a kind of that kind of conversation. My kids are 11 and 14. Mm. And, um, you know, it's been humbling and I'm I'm super close to them. But I also feel like it's given me the chance to open a door that is um, the door of of trust and, and freedom and authenticity. And it's mm -hmm. scary. And now I'm just mm -hmm. thinking, oh. <laughs> there are a handful of other people that I, I feel like it with all kind of, and not to say, hey, I want to have this conversation. Tell me how great I am, but really to say, I, I really care about you. I, I try so hard, but I know I've dropped the ball at times. You know, uh -huh. and if there's just anything you want to say to me, I'd love to say it because I really, want, I really love you, and I want to see you. You know, with the thing that we say with, um, in, in my family. Um, I see you, I hear you, I love you. Like we really try <laughs> to live that. And so I'm kind yeah. of I'm kind of excited about this doing this in my own life. I'll uh you and I are gonna be talking again soon. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a go and I'm gonna report back to you. I'm gonna put okay. myself I'm... in the little uh the the little uh, relationship lab. Okay, I got about five million other questions. So we gotta keep moving. So okay. something that I had heard, and I wanna see if this is true or not true. I had heard I was chatting with um some uh family lawyers who uh, essentially said that the um, uh, incidence of narcissism as a reason for divorce has gone through the roof in the last uh, like five to eight years. And I'm just wondering if you've seen narcissism and other forms of um, you know more serious mental health disorders as ruining relationships. Are these things more prevalent um, <laughs> or are they just, does it seem like, or you know, or is this uh, these divorce lawyers uh, mistaken? Oh my gosh! Okay, this is a really did I ask you sir? Zing, <laughs> zing! I feel the zing. I'm feeling the zing. Uh, okay, here's the deal. I, um, I, I, my doubt. If I had to place money, I would place mm -hmm. money on the fact that there is actually not more incidents okay. of yep. narcissistic personality disorder. 
what there's more incidence of is people gaining access to mental health language and frameworks via social mm. media and oftentimes mm. taking, you know, a 30 second reel and turning it into a diagnostic assessment of their spouse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that there's, I think that there's for as much as I love, you know, and I'm part of it. I have an Instagram feed. I have a podcast. Mm -hmm. I am sharing. Mm -hmm. I am, I am, you know, my mm -hmm. whole mission is bringing um, mm -hmm. wisdom out from behind, you know, a therapist's office door out from behind a research lab. Mm -hmm. um, and I strive to do that responsibly and I, you know, probably fall short at times, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm part of this. So I'm part of this conversation of helping us all understand ourselves and each other better. Now, mm -hmm. where it gets tricky is if somebody is in an unhappy marriage and they're given basically this like, you know, shiny idea that you are unhappy right. because your spouse is a narcissist, then I feel better, right? Because now it isn't me. Because I can make them. it about them. I can make it about them. And so as a couples therapist, what I'll tell you is that just doesn't, you know, th there's things are cycles and things are dynamic. And mm -hmm. so that is part of it is that I think there's something very compelling about this idea that if I stick a label on my partner's head, then I mm -hmm. am the victim of my partner's narcissism. Okay. So we can hold mm -hmm. that. What we also have to hold is most likely if we went back to these family lawyers, what they would tell us is it is probably most often a woman diagnosing her husband. So I do think, I do think that we have a collective massive problem with the fact that self-help books and therapy are predominantly consumed by women. And so women have had many, many mm. years. I grew up, you know, I grew up in a house where my mom was reading self-help books and, you know, mm -hmm. my stepdad wasn't, um, where women are kind of running circles around men. This is, this is this idea that patriarchy hurts us all, right? Patriarchy hurts mm -hmm. women eight ways Sunday, but patriarchy also teaches men that feelings are weakness, that tears are weakness, mm -hmm. that saying you're wrong is weakness, that mm -hmm. validating your wife's emotions is weakness. So we have we spend a lifetime teaching our boys to stuff their feelings down and then punishing the men they grow into for not being able to hold space for their wives' pain. And what mm -hmm. they get in return for years of rolling their eyes at their wives because they don't know what to do with her pain mm -hmm. What they get in return mm -hmm. is stuck with a narcissism label in divorce court. Yes. How's that for a hot take? <laughs> that is a hot take. That is a hot take. Well, but it, and it, it it feels like and and yes, in some extreme cases it's true. But I wonder 100%. if it, right. And but I what I wonder if what you've seen is in your practice is an opportunity back to okay if you're the if you're a wife who has felt unseen and unheard. And that's how I've been at times. And my husband and I have talked about it really openly. And he just, he does such a better job of it now. Uh -huh. But I'm also showing up so differently in how I, right. what I'm asking him for, right? When I scream at him, <laughs> uh, you know what? <laughs> he really has a hard time hearing me. Let's just let's just say it at that. So let's just call that you... what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I'm I'm not proud of myself, uh -huh. um, but I'm also doing my own work and trying to uh -huh. show up in a way that that I can really see him and it's like wow amazing when I show up a little differently the dynamic changes and but I again I feel like there's that resistance thing where it's like well I don't want to be a doormat and I'm like I'm not a I, I feel like when I show up in my in kind of some degree of harmony and some degree of clarity it doesn't make me a doormat it it really transforms things yeah. And so I'm wondering with your, with, um, in your practice, if, you know, and again, and just in your observations of people, if there are, are situations where somebody is so convinced the other person, and again, whether it's man or woman, two men, two women, whatever it is, they're so convinced the other person is a narcissist, if there's an opportunity, or if you've seen it, that that can get totally um, transformed. Because, you know, we bring the worst out. Like when we're angry, right. oh my God, I right. brought the worst out in my husband, right? Mm -hmm. I, my, my brother likes to joke, my favorite bumper sticker, the beatings will continue till the morale improves. Like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> That's right. You know? <laughs> That's and, right. and then we wonder why we're not getting what yeah. we want, right? Yeah. When we, we are showing up in a way that makes us hard to love is what I've yeah. experienced in, certainly in my marriage and in another relationship. So yeah. I don't know. I guess my question for you is 
for those yeah. for those people that you've treated or that you work with that are convinced the other person is a narcissist, you know, what what do you say, you know, if, if there was somebody listening right now, what would you say to them? Uh-huh. Yeah. There may very they may very well be. There's about ten percent mm-hmm. of the population that, you know, actually meets those criteria. Oh, it's actually ten percent. I didn't realize it was mm-hmm. that high. Oh, well shoot. And and mm-hmm. there are there are lots of ways that under stress, we all show signs of narcissism. What is the heart of narcissism? Is difficulty putting yourself in the other person's shoes. So uh-huh. there's a way that we all uh-huh. become sort of like self referential under yeah. stress. And yeah. And what you, especially if this is a woman talking about her male partner, what mm-hmm. she may have her finger exactly on the pulse of is that he really is underskilled in this area. I feel like I spend with my heterosexual couples, I spend a lot of time doing empathy training for mm-hmm. him, right? Mm-hmm. I'm working on ca- helping her approach differently, which is oftentimes very mm-hmm. hard where she's like, you've got to be kidding me. We're saying yeah. that, I'm part, that my approach is the problem. Did you see how he rolled his eyes? Did you see how he, uh, yes, butted uh-huh. me? Yes, absolutely. And so I'm working kind of, I'm working both sides. I'm uh-huh. digging where the uh-huh. ground is soft, as we say. And yeah. I know that his his work is to um, is to be able to kind of decenter his own defensiveness. And oftentimes what makes this so difficult, this is, I feel like, the secret thing I know about husbands after 25 years of working with them, it is exquisitely painful for a husband to feel like he's a disappointment to his wife, to see Oh my gosh, yeah, no kidding. It's mm-hmm. horrible. Mm-hmm. When I say that, she oftentimes can't believe it because she doesn't, she has no clue what she sees. What she sees is defensiveness and mm-hmm. um, kind of like belligerence, but that is a cover yeah. for the shame, the fear, the terror, the panic, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not justifying it. I'm not justifying. It. But when that when that work happens, he starts to look a whole lot less like a narcissist and more like a kind of fumbling but earnest, yeah. you know, human being. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that because I, I feel like, again, back to the beginning of our conversation, how how often we just it's like we don't want to give the other person the benefit of the doubt we want to make them now we want to but we're so frustrated it's like we're at our wits end we're in so much pain ourselves that we're just so convinced the other person is to blame and then Mm -hmm. everything falls apart and i i love Mm -hmm. what you're saying i've seen that in my own marriage i mean i've been a real jerk to my husband at times Mm -hmm. and god bless the guy for <laughs> giving me a chance to to do better mm-hmm. right and I realize it can mm-hmm. be complicated but I yeah. I just I keep coming back fundamentally to this point I do believe unless except for the in the extreme cases all of us have more power than we realize and yeah. that empathy yeah. that sincere empathy and being willing I describe it as being willing to um, meet people where they are mm-hmm. is a superpower uh-huh. And, you know, it's it it is something I've had to work really hard in my own life. OK, I have a, a uh, another burning question for you when it comes to therapists doing their own work to do this kind of, you know, like really being able to look within. How do you feel like um, your colleagues are doing? And I you know, I say that because I've, I've had some great therapists. I've had some not so great therapists. And when I think about we are in a, a loneliness epidemic. We're in a relationship crisis in our society. Mm-hmm. And what I know for sure in my life, I am so much better equipped to give advice and be empathetic because I've done so much of yeah. my own work. So not to make it about me, but I am I am really yeah. curious because the you know therapists and different kind of healing professionals on the front line, we need them more than ever. And yet at times I do wonder if um, we're you know, at a disadvantage because these folks haven't figured out, you know, maybe how to how to get as far as they they could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I would certainly have a hard time trusting a therapist who hasn't done their own therapy. Right. So when in, in the mm-hmm. training program where I've been teaching for many, many years, you know, that is really um, essential is that is that therapists really understand what both sides of the room feel like. So certainly mm-hmm. that self-work and the ongoing self-work is vital for a therapist. The other thing that's vital mm-hmm. is um is for clients, I, I really encourage when I'm doing, when I'm educating the public about how to be in therapy, I really encourage mm-hmm. clients to bring feedback to their therapists. Um, 
Mm. A, because it's a chance, it's a chance to practice relationship skills out there. You know, this is a, it's a, it's a skill, it's an art and a science of how do you bring feedback to somebody in a way that they can hear and in a way that really invites okay. the other person to partner with you and look at what happened, you know, kind of together and collaboratively. Mm-hmm. So it can be safe to practice that with a therapist. So when you feel like your therapist has had a particularly human day, you know, or they've let you down or they mm-hmm. misunderstood mm-hmm. you or they made a joke that felt hurtful, um, they got yeah. something wrong, you know, whatever it was, to come back and mm-hmm. say, can we talk about this? And every therapist who is worth their fee knows how to hear feedback, you know, and, and has been trained mm-hmm. in how mm-hmm. you sit with a client who's frustrated with you. It's not easy. Definitely not easy mm-hmm. because we as therapists want to do right by our clients. Yes. We want to be um, admired by our clients. It's really hard to feel like we've let a client down, but there's so much richness that can come so, from a client. Alexandra, in the in the in in service to open relationships, have you gotten that feedback before? And then, and, and if so, what did you do with it? Absolutely, because right? it could be easy to be defensive, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it could be easy to be defensive. Yeah, because. Listen, one of the things that happens is, you know, my clients, my clients experience of frustration with me may be A, because I really did drop the ball. It may be B, Mm -hmm. that they're projecting something that has to do with their mom, their sister, Mm -hmm. their spouse. They're projecting that onto Mm -hmm. me. Or C, Mm -hmm. there's some truth in the middle, you know. And, um, Mm -hmm. and so, but I know darn well, I'm not ever going to be able to invite my client to say, wow. I wonder, you know, when you when you got mad at me about that, it was reminding me, remember what happened like a month or two ago with your mom? It sort of feels like a similar dynamic. I'm not ever going to be able mm-hmm. to invite my client to look at that until and unless I yeah, have right. like metabolized the feedback. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and I have to, and I really do want to bear witness to my client's pain because I mm-hmm. may have gotten it wrong. The other thing that's really real is, you know, through the pandemic, we therapists were frontline workers as well. You know, we were on the emotional front lines. And so the burnout rates among therapists are higher than ever. No, I, I appreciate it. I think it's a good, it is a, it's great advice with a, a lot of people seeking therapy to um, up up the opportunity to really um, develop that bond with the, with their therapist Um in a way that can feel a little scary. It's actually a really interesting idea because you don't usually think of it like that, but it does feel mm-hmm. like it's an opportunity, like you say, to go be, to be practicing in the wild so as <laughs> well. If they respond well, okay, it strikes me like in any other kind of relationship where there's that something is at risk and they pass a test, okay, now uh, greater trust has been developed. Shit, they didn't pass a test. That's right better to learn earlier, I guess, right, than continue to um, work with somebody and pay them um, if that bond yeah. is not able to support the, you know, the the depth of the work. That's right. And there's, there's actually research that shows, yeah, we call it, you know, that's called the, the therapeutic alliance. The alliance is a relationship between the client and the therapist. And when researchers have studied therapeutic alliances, the strongest alliances are ones, in fact, that have had tears and repairs. So that process, just like in a relationship, Mm -hmm. that process of rift, Mm -hmm. misunderstanding and repair strengthens a relationship. Yeah. There are times where I've, when I've, you know, shown up in a session the next week with my clients and I said, hey, I want to go back and revisit a moment from last week because I don't like how I handled that, you know, so that it also may be the case that a a therapist will go back and say, I didn't, I didn't like that, you know, I didn't like how I handled that. And I want to just check in with you about how that was. This is also really important when there are cultural differences between therapists and clients, um, racial differences, significant mm-hmm. age differences, sexuality differences, because ther- we all, especially those of us with privilege, we end up with blind spots, you know, and so a therapist Are you trying to tell to- me that uh, therapists are human too, Alexandra? Mm, I wish, <laughs> I know, I so wish we were all like the, the Dalai Lama, you know, but we are not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. So, okay, speaking of therapists, I'm going to um, reference one of my favorite ones, uh, Stan Tacken. He's one of our favorites. He has noted on this show that we are all a-holes at times. <laughs> and i have just like, oh, my God, Stan, thanks for keeping it real, baby. I love you. Aww. And so we, in the spirit of that, there is a feature on Reddit, Am I the A-hole? Yeah. And yeah. what we have found on the show is that we have uh, our guests read the letter or we'll read the letter 
and then uh, weigh in on their on the perspective here, right? And kind of back to this idea, I love that as a as a starting point. I almost want to say to everybody, if you can just say to yourself, "Yeah, I, I am the a hole sometimes," you know, it just feels like it could create a whole new level of understanding between us, mm-hmm. right? But um, we picked a meaty problem for you, uh, Alexandra. Um, so, am I the a hole? for telling Mm -hmm. my sister she is no longer the it girl. So I have a sister. We are from a small town where everyone knows each other. When we were younger, she was the it girl of our town. She was really pretty, social, well-liked by everyone in general. I was the opposite. I looked like Dobie from Harry Potter. I was extremely skinny, had crooked teeth, frizzy hair, and a huge nose. When people saw us together, they would get really surprised. They would often ask whether we have the same dad. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I always felt like my sister was ashamed of me. The thing that really annoyed me was when her friends would make fun of me, they would call me the little goblin, and my sister never stuck up for me. Mm. Since I, um, anyway, since I knew from a young age people wouldn't like me for my looks, I always worked on my grades. I went to a good university, then I worked on my looks. I gained weight, got um, a great hair care routine, a nose job, and braces. Now I look a 7 out of 10. My sister's life, on the other hand, didn't go so well. She went to the university and dropped out, got married and divorced, and moved back at home and works in a market. She also gained a lot of weight because of stress. This summer, she called me asking whether she could come stay with me and my fiancé. She told me she can't live with my mom anymore and there's nothing to do in a small town. I agreed, and she started living with us. The issue is, whenever she gets the chance, she talks about our past. She says how much I changed myself and tells everyone my looks weren't always that great. The other day, we were out with my friends, and she did it again. Uh, But she also showed the most unflattering childhood picture of me, and people started laughing. I don't know what happened, but I I started seeing red. I told her Mm. she also looks really different now, like 40 pounds heavier. She is also no longer the it girl, so she should stop acting that way. She is the girl who lives with her sister rent-free and tries to embarrass her. Uh, We are currently not talking. So am I the a-hole? What what oh would you God. what advice would you give to this young lady? Yeah, I would say that neither of these sisters is the a hole, and both of these Different. sisters, um, you know, are in a tremendous amount of pain. And I just mm-hmm. as you were reading it, I had this image of the two sisters sitting on the couch together, you know, with um, maybe some photos from childhood, and just loving on those little girls that they were. You know, like there's just so much old healing that has to come so now you know the sister the sister who's struggling now she's experienced like this sort of quote-unquote fall from grace and so there's a way in which what you know what she needs to be saying to her younger self is like you know embrace your beauty embrace your popularity but know that your soul you know lies so much deeper than any of that and know that if you yeah. anchor all of your worth on how you look right now, it's just fragile. It's fragile. There's no room. There's like no wiggle room in it. And mm-hmm. what the other sister who felt like she was the ugly duckling growing up, what she used to say to her young younger self is, you know, I see your beauty. I see your effort. I see your struggle. Like there's, you know, and I would I would want these two sisters to look at what was going on in our family system that we mm-hmm. rather than cheering for each other we tore each other down you know what were the conditions in our family system where where resources felt scarce parental attention felt scarce and so we were willing to throw each other under the bus you know for the sake of feeling um settled on our own inside like there's just a lot of grief that needs to happen um Mm -hmm. and i think that probably the sister who now feels you know beautiful um i wonder it, you know, she certainly knows, she knows the place that her that her struggling sister is in, right? She knows what it is to feel, quote unquote, ugly. She knows what it is to feel, you know, worthless. And so can she extend empathy while also saying, it's not okay. It's not okay for you to make fun of me in front of our friends. That touches a really old mm-hmm. wound inside of me, right? So I think mm-hmm. that the sister who wrote in could be firm with her sister like listen no more no more because because I used to feel so embarrassed as a kid and I I just I won't tolerate that anymore and when you when you throw me under the bus or make fun of me in front of people it it keeps me from being able to do what I want to do which is offer you empathy and support and cheerleading because I can see that you're struggling I don't I don't need to judge you for struggling I don't want to judge you for struggling I want to support you that's why you're living with me 
Um, but mm-hmm. it makes it hard, right? You cut, you cut me. I'm cut off from my ability to support you when you make fun of me. Yeah. No, I love that advice. And back to um, the superpower that empathy can play in our lives. And like you say, both of these women are clearly hurting, and I yeah. feel like they have a chance to to really see each other and be real allies and advocates rather than enemies. And let's face it, I mean, so often when we're hurting, uh, we see each other as enemies. And I, mm-hmm. I don't get that Darwinian uh, tendency, but I've certainly seen it in my own life. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I mean, I always say someone has to go first, right? And someone if I'm waiting for the other person to go first, <laughs> I might wait a long time, so it better be me. Yeah. And so the one, the woman who wrote in, she's saying, am I the asshole? So I don't, yeah. so it's neither that she's the asshole. She's neither the victim nor the perpetrator, but she certainly, when she was little, yeah. she felt like a victim. And now she is afraid yeah. she's a perpetrator. So these two sisters need yeah. a framework that is more expansive than that, that they both, you know, they both have hurt and there have been times mm-hmm. where they have played out their tender stuff against each other. And that is a tragedy because they actually, mm-hmm. You know, our siblings are our very, very, very first friends, right? They're the keepers more than anybody okay. else on this earth. They're the keepers of our memories. And um, well, and, and yeah, their ability to keep it real, right? I mean, it's like there you can't hide very much, I feel like, uh-uh. when it comes to a sibling and and for good reason, uh-huh. right? I feel like it really, you, like you say, some of our very first friends, we share so many memories and I realize a lot of sibling relationships are fraught and there's a lot of no contact between yeah. siblings. And, um, you know, we always say to our boys, my husband especially, hey, you guys have to look out for each other because especially your mom and I aren't going to be here forever. And, y- you know, it's really you you have a gift to be brothers and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and take that seriously, Yeah, uh, which I yeah. feel like is yeah. my husband's from India. And I feel like that it I don't feel like I hear that as much from um, American parents. Right. I think it feels right. like yeah. it's a little more like, hey, you know, um, OK, I, I promised mm-hmm. I'd um, uh, ask a question or two from Joanna since she's not here. And one of the mm. ones that I was dying to ask that she wrote down was how do we move past prescribed family roles, i.e. the golden child, the scapegoat, um, <laughs> you know, the black sheep um, when they're harming our adult relationships? And I'm going to chime in by saying in in some of the um friends and family that I've um, observed, especially recently, some of those calcified roles, right, where, say, um, one sibling made it made things okay for another sibling. And and he or she has been um, kind of bearing bearing that responsibility unfairly for decades. It just when she asks us, like, oh, yes. Yeah. How do we how do we break? I mean, you talk about breaking patterns. How do we break those patterns? What do Mm we what can we do about these freaking prescribed family rules that feel so calcified. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking just, I was thinking about rules in terms of the question that we just answered. You know, I think there's a way in which Isn't the it? golden yeah. child, which is what the it girl mm-hmm. was. She was the golden it girl, child. Right. Exactly. That's, there's a burden. There's a burden associated with the it girl. It's fragile as heck, right? As, as she showed, mm-hmm. you're not, you're not ever, you're not allowed to gain 40 pounds. You're not allowed to be divorced. You're not allowed, you know, so that all then kind of challenges that notion that she ought not have ever been yoked with in the first place you know she always ought to have been able to be all facets of herself okay so how do we grow out of these prescribed roles i think one this has been a lot of the work that i've been doing lately in fact we have a family of origins quiz on um on my website that people can can take to start to like develop that language of roles because we the reason we want to understand the role we play in our family of origin is that we end up bringing that role into our adult relationships and that's the calcification that Joanna's talking about, mm-hmm. where we sort of feel like we're stuck forever in that role. And um, I think it is by it is by understanding, kind of going back to the beginning and understanding why we played that role in the first place. Roles have functions. You know, they serve a function mm-hmm. of keeping a family system stable. They serve a function of getting us the attention that without which when we're little, we would die. You know, we need parental mm-hmm. attention. We need belonging. So we will play a role to get that. So it served a function then. So when we understand the function that it served, we can understand then what parts of ourself went underdeveloped or undeveloped for the sake of the role. Mm -hmm. So I think the work starts with us. Like it starts with us saying, okay, as the golden child, it's really hard for me to be vulnerable. As the golden child, 
I tend to hide my mistakes from everybody else and become defensive yeah. and yes, but my way when somebody is like, hey, I don't like what you did. So it begins by Ooh, us Yes, but my way. I like that. That's a good one to watch out for. Sorry, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. So that's that's it, really. And, I, you know, we can't, I think so often what we want to shout is, I'm not the person I used to be. Like, we want other people, we want other people mm-hmm. to free us from the roles we used to play. Mm-hmm. But I think it's another way we give away our power. So I think that mm-hmm. transformation starts by us understanding what, you know, what were the benefits of that role? What are the gifts I developed as part of that role? What remains underdeveloped? Mm-hmm. And how do I begin to kind of stretch myself? And then invite other people to see me as I am now. But it doesn't start with us. Mm-hmm. We're going to end up feeling like we're forcing people to see us differently. And um, and then it becomes like this tug of war. No, you're not. Yes, you are. No, I, you know, it becomes a tug of war rather than just having that start from within us. And if what if, how about when you are the black sheep or the uh, maybe the one that feels like... Um, you know, the scapegoat, uh, how, what do you do when you're in that role? Because in a lot of ways, it feels like um, it's easier if, if you say, if you say, hey, well, I was a golden child and, and, and you know, I've been yes budding my way all the way through. But it does feel like you're a little bit more one up when you're um, the golden child versus one mm-hmm. down when you've been the scapegoat. So do you have any mm-hmm. different advice for if, if you've been in, in, in the role that probably is, the, if you will, the role that's maybe harder? Yeah. 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 Right. So the scapegoat is the one where everybody, where everyone in the system sort of sees you as the problem, Mm -hmm. right? You're sort of the problem. You're the squeaky wheel. It's always on you. So Mm -hmm. I think that there's, I think the first step is again, sort of like within like healing and tending to the shame that that created, like all of those years where you really did believe that you were the problem Mm -hmm. or where you allowed everybody to kind of continue that narrative because you knew that people needed to believe that you were the problem in order to feel okay about themselves. So it begins Uh by you healing the shame that comes along with that, letting yourself be angry that that was a spot you ought not ever have been in. Um, Uh And then, and then perhaps, you know, it, it, it moves towards that kind of curious conversation. Like, Hey, I feel like there are ways that I'm, you know, that you are, you're using some outdated perceptions of me. And I wonder mm-hmm. if you might be mm-hmm. able to get to know me today as I am today. I know that I struggled. I know mm-hmm. you, mm-hmm. I'm the one who knows more than anybody about my struggles. And right. I also know how hard I've worked to find a path in my own life that is a path of stability, a path of pride, a path of you know self-acceptance. Right. And I would like to invite you to get to know me today. Mm-hmm. Right. And not, I need you to get to know me like this, no, but I invite no, you, right? Very no. different. Yeah. 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 But because I feel like there's a lot of that I need, you know, we were talking about that before. I love that. And I'll say this in terms of our own family. I have two of the greatest boys in the world. Um, uh, and they've both done a little bit of therapy, which is obviously very common sure. for all of us. Um, there was one time one of our sons was going through a tough phase and I went with him to the therapist and just said, listen, I'm going to sit in as much as you guys are okay with it. Um, This therapist is awesome. Suzanne, if you're listening, we love you. Um, (laughs) And to say, you know, child, because I have two, um, it's not you. This is, this is all happening within our family dynamic. Right. And I just, I, I encourage any um, parents who feel like they've got that one problem child and air quotes to go like, a freaking never call them that when they can hear it and don't even think no. it. You know what I mean? Like, no. because That's I feel right. like it really, like that projects. And I got to say, I was proud of myself that I went and said, this is not on you. This is on us. And I am here to listen and change as I need to for you. Beautiful. Because, you know, you're you're struggling here a little bit and, and things are yep. a little bit kind of cattywampus, but we're in it together. Yep. And it's not just about you. It is about us. And, you know, and it was, we had a, a handful of good sessions and, and the sun is thriving, mm. but I, I was glad to be able yep. to have the wisdom to show up and say that because I do feel like for so often it is that the black sheet, the scapegoat, the problem child. And honestly, that sucks. And I just think as parents, okay. we got to do better. Like that, that can't ever be 
what our kids feel. I shouldn't say can't because it is a lot. I know. And not to shit on each other, <laughs> but that's it shouldn't right, that's be. That's right. That's right. That's right. It should yeah. not be. Anyway, um, Alexandra, I know you have a hard out in just a couple minutes. So before we wrap up, anything burning that we didn't cover or uh, just uh, a final word um, on open relationships before we wrap up? No, you were you were wonderful to be in conversation Hello. with you. Asked great <laughs> questions. I feel like we covered a lot of ground. It was lots of fun. You you put me through the through my paces. It was wonderful. I wonderful, really love it. Engaging. Well, I I learned. Thank you. I learned a lot, and like I said, I just started your book, and I love how it's set up. So there's something for me every single day. And I just I think Happy I'll time. say this when I think about I, I'm like your mom. I've read a lot of self help books. I'm on a journey. What I love about your book is that it is meant to be. Um, practical and done. And this is um, Love Every Day, uh -huh. your, um, um, Dr. Solomon's new book. Because when I think about making change, I always say change starts with me. And uh -huh. as somebody who who takes this seriously, I think about a book in this format that is really meant to be done daily. Uh -huh. That is super cool. And I, I'm a massive yeah. reader, so I'm reading stuff all the time. But so often you, you read something and, and it's like, that's great. And then it kind of slowly or in my case more quickly drifts away <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. I am I'm excited just to um, have you in my life every day for the next 365 days well that's wonderful okay. thank you thank you yeah all right this is our show uh, thanks for tuning in to open relationships transforming together you know where to find us we if you love the show please let us know please subscribe please share us with your friends we are working so hard to bring you amazing guests like Dr. Solomon and have these really rich, vulnerable conversations because we cannot transform alone. Uh -huh. We are relational beings. We can only really transform together. I think of it like I do um, martial arts and it's like I could do my katas all day long beautifully, but it's when I'm sparring and not in a bad way. It is when I'm sparring, that's when I'm mastering my skills. And so when I think about in a relational way, um, yeah, we can do things amazingly by ourselves in a vacuum, <laughs> but but yep. then we don't master them. Yep. So, okay. Uh, thanks. And uh, we will see you on the next episode of Open Relationships Transforming Together. <laughs>